Hi everyone, this is Janet Hill at the Rock Island County Health Department. Thank you for joining us. Today is the 12th of November and today we have Ed Rivers of the Rock Island County Health Department and Dr. Jessica Royson, who is a philosophy and ethics professor at St. Ambrose University. First of all, I will start it off, start us off with Rock Island County numbers. We have 121 new cases today for 6,105. Uh, in addition, we have two deaths to report today. One is a man in his 50s, another is a man in his 90s. Both had been hospitalized. We now have 111 total deaths from COVID. We send our deepest or sympathies to both of these men's families and um, wish them well. Thank you very much. In Scott County today, the Iowa Department of Public Health reports 7,610 cases and 54 deaths. This includes two deaths reported today by the Iowa Department of Public Health. We're deeply dismayed that we've lost two more members of our community to this virus, and we send our sympathy to their families. Quad City is an at a critical point in the COVID-19 pandemic. We've had two goals for our community, to slow the spread of the virus and to protect our healthcare system from becoming overwhelmed. I'm sad to report we have failed at one and are dangerously close to failing at both. The spread of the virus is increasing at a faster rate each day. We've gone from an average of 60 cases in the middle of October in Scott County to 250 plus cases per day this week. Another indication is our positivity rate. In Scott County, we hovered around 7% positivity for a number of weeks. That number jumped to around 16% during the first week of November and is now above 23%. This means that in the first, uh, excuse me, the last 14 days, almost one in four people who were tested were positive. Rock Island County has only slightly less with a seven day rolling average positivity rate of 20%. Spread of the virus is rampant in our community at this point. Even if you still don't know anyone who has an illness or has had a bad outcome, with this rate of cases, it won't be long. You've heard the pleas from our hospitals over the last two weeks. You've heard them express their concern that they may not be able to accommodate every patient who requires an ICU bed. Even if more beds were available, trained staff are limited. Hospitals are losing staff to illness and quarantine. We're now being told that we may soon reach a point where the staff and the resources needed to support you should you need more advanced medical treatment might not be available. So we have two options moving forward. Option one is continue on our current course in which some in our community mask and distance, and the others live their daily lives if we weren't in a pandemic. This hasn't worked so far, and there's no reason to believe that will change. Option two is all of us, members of the public, business owners, community leaders, students, and employees, get on the same page and agree on one thing. We cannot be a healthy, prosperous community if we do not slow this pandemic down. That means we all mask. We all cancel gatherings. We all only go out for essential. We all immediately isolate if we have symptoms and we all stay in quarantine for the entire duration. The key to all this is you, our neighbors, our residents, our community members, our neighbors. We've been explaining for months why it's important for people to mask up in this. We provided reasons why it's important. We've highlighted the damage this ongoing pandemic has had on the business. We've stressed the impact on our health system, yet we still haven't seen it happen. Dr. Jessica Royzen joins us today to talk about the ethics of compliance with public health prevention measures. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you mentioned, my, my name is Jessica Royzen, and um, I'm also a certified healthcare ethics consultant, and part of what that means is that um, I, I'm trained into, in helping people understand how to respond in situations where there's some sort of an ethical dilemma. Um, 
And I wanted to address just a few points with you during this, this little minute, limited amount of time. And most importantly, um, if, if we take nothing else away, it's, it's the need for us to follow the recommended guidelines. And I think that, I think it's worth noting that the public health messaging has changed over the course of, of um, this time. It seems like, you know, in the beginning, people felt like they were being, being told one thing and then that changed to something else. And for some people, I think that has been um, almost like a license to not change their behavior. Like, well, if we don't know for sure what to do, then, you know, we don't need to do anything. And I think that that has, we've officially reached the point where that's no longer accurate. I think we are getting consistent messaging and that the compliance um, that we're being asked to perform is, is asking very, very little <laughs> um, in some cases. And so um, the first thing that I think it's important for us to remember is, you know, as we've heard our whole lives, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, you heard those numbers, they are staggering. And public adherence may be the single most effective measure in reducing the harm caused by any pandemic illness, but especially this one. Um, if you look at the research, you know, we have added something like 35 years to the lifespan in the United States, but um, only a tiny portion of that has been the result of improved health care. 83% of that comes from improved sanitation and prevention of illness. So it's the things we're doing to prevent illness that are keeping us the healthiest. Our doctors are amazing. Our nurses are dedicated. But what we can do to, um, what we can do, what we have control over in this time where we have very little control um, is to take those efforts to keep ourselves and those around us healthy. That's the only thing we can really control and this gives us an opportunity to um, to do something and feel like we are we're making an effort. Um, I just noticed there's been kind of a meme going around about how you know during this pandemic you're leaving the house um, you're like oh shoot I forgot my mask um, you know like I'm Batman or something. And very rarely in our lives do we get the opportunity to be the hero and um, to be Batman. And so if that's all it takes is to remember you know have those masks with you, be washing your hands when you can, um, whenever you have the opportunity. It, it doesn't eliminate the risk, um, but it significantly diminishes it. And I don't think any of us wanna be in a situation, um, you know, a year from now or two years from now where we think, wow, we could have done more. We could have done more and we could have changed things sooner. And being asked to do very little, I mean, ethics ultimately comes down to a cost-benefit analysis. What are you being asked to do versus how much of a difference do you think it can make? And in situations where um, what we're being asked to do is just, you know, follow, follow the rules, follow the guidelines, um, and then find some creative ways to continue to um, to be the people that we are. I know holidays are coming and people are wanting to, um, they miss their families and they miss normalcy and they want to be able to just do regular things. But we are so very lucky to live in a time where, you know, we can have Zoom meetings with our families if we need to. Um, we can take the time to make those phone calls. We can, we can create other solutions uh, and people are doing amazing things to do that and to protect each other. Um, so I think that, um, you know, something that I think is very powerful is that when we don't take the time to follow guidelines and do um, the things we're being asked to do, um, we're really just transferring the responsibility to someone else. And so, you know, rather than us taking responsibility for our own health care and for the health of the people around us, we just transfer it to someone else. And um, I was thinking as I was walking through the grocery store the other day, there was a woman who um, had an infant in her cart. And I thought, you know, it's so hard when you have a new baby and you're all, you know, you're just trying to figure things out. Um, but to have that new baby at a time like this, and naturally the baby doesn't have a mask on, there's no way that, you know, she's going to be able to pull that off or anybody who um, has small children, there's no way you're going to be able to convince them to to stay masked up and safe. And so every time I think, 
the rest of us make the choice to, um, to, to do what we're being asked and to follow those guidelines, we're protecting not just those kids, but you know, those moms that are struggling and already doing everything they can, just making an, a little extra effort to your neighbor. Yes, it's the holidays. We would love to be able to be close with our families, but I think we will have so much to celebrate in the future that we want to keep everyone as healthy as we can so we can have those celebrations in the future so we can do those things. Um, I think that, um, you know, we've done things like this before when we think about the way that we handled um, secondhand smoke um, and that we understand what it means for a group effort to make a difference. Um, we know how that works. We've done it before. We can do it again. We all want to get back to normal as soon as possible. Um, and I think that, um, that these are the things that we can do in order to get back to normal as soon as possible. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say was um, just to be mindful of the fact that not everyone is in the same situation. Um, and so how we address each other, how we make those gentle reminders, um, how we, um, um, you know, ask each other to be compliant, I think is important because I don't think, you know, there's not a person among us who responds well to being um, called out or publicly chastised. And we don't always know the whole story of why someone is in the situation that they're in, why they're acting the way they are. Um, but I think every one of us could use, um, could use some extra kindness and some extra grace right now. So, you know, there may be a reason why somebody forgot their mask, why somebody, you know, did whatever, but, but we can always just very gently remind, you know, hey, I have some extra masks in my cart. Do you need one? Can I help you out? Is there something, what can I do to help? Um, because we all are just looking long-term goal. How do we all get us to the point where we're healthy and we're safe? And, um, you know, being, being cruel or being judgmental of each other in the short term isn't going to help us get there. So if there's something we can do to make a difference to help the people around us, I think we're really called to do that at this time. That's how we all get back to normal as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen, for, um, Rosen, for sharing some of that information that I think really gets at some of the things that we're trying to do here and um, helps us respond as a community. Um, any of our media partners, if you have questions, please type it into the chat. We will go through those. And we have had one so far. Um, Janet, perhaps we can have you answer this one first. Um, since this strategy, which I'm assuming is the prevention measures that we've been talking about since the beginning, hasn't worked over the last several weeks and months, will you come up with some different measures? So unfortunately, we don't have another set of strategies. Uh, we know that masks work. We know that social distancing works. And uh, we know that um, people are reluctant to do that. And as the professor just talked about, it is a matter of taking care of your community. And if you don't want to, you know, if you, if you cannot, if you can just think a little bit beyond yourself, um, that is how we're going to get through this. Um, in Illinois, it's a little bit different. Um, there are um, some consequences if we don't do the right thing. You know, we are in this, uh, tier one of mitigations. We very quickly are heading toward tier two mitigations. And then our neighbors to the north in region one, which includes Whiteside County and all the way up to the Wisconsin border, and then all the way over to almost the Chicago suburbs, they are looking at going into tier three. And tier three is a set of restrictions that you probably remember as phase three. That is non-essential businesses being closed um, to in-person shopping. Uh, that, that pretty much is the, the way that we have to look at this, is if we don't do the right thing, there are going to be severe consequences. Thank you. Um, another question, I think I received this on my own here. We are hearing lots of complaints of being unable to get a test in a timely manner. Are there any plans in the works for more pop-up testing sites, either with Test Iowa or on the Illinois side? Um, should we start with Test Iowa first? Ed, would you like to address that? Yes, I believe the governor said today that they're planning on ramping up uh, Test Iowa to do more tests. 
uh, locally. We were doing a little bit over 300 tests. I understand that the average for a test hour now is over 500. So we perhaps expect to see an increase in availability of appointments with the test Iowa program still. And Janet, for Illinois, any news about some uh, popped up testing, excuse me, sites? Not at this point, um, though I know that we are working with the uh, State Department of Public Health to get a temporary testing site here for a longer period of time, like you might remember we had in July. We don't have dates to announce at this point, but we hope to soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, on our website and on our Facebook pages, um, there are a list of places that, that we know that you can get um, testing. And uh, there is a website called do I need a COVID-19 test.com that links you to um, several pharmacies throughout the area that are doing drive through testing. And Ed or Janet, do you, um, either of you have any stories or anecdotal information you received lately from contact tracers in terms of what they're hearing from positive individuals or contacts that they're interviewing at the moment? My most recent conversation with our case investigators indicates that uh, household transmission and transmission at uh, gatherings in the community are being mentioned more often uh, than in prior weeks. I would echo that. We are hearing a lot of um, small and large family gatherings, including weddings that um, should not be happening. And we understand why people want to have them, but uh, we, this is extremely risky behavior. So I would say that um, a lot of the transmission is happening with people who um, are spending time together outside of their households. I was struck by uh, your case investigator, Janet, um, account of a group that went out to a restaurant they said, we did everything right. We wore our masks, but then they sat down and ate, and it was not a single household party. One of them was ill, and then they all were. So you have to be exceedingly careful with whom uh, you associate, because you never know when people are going to be ill. They could be uh, infected and not symptomatic and passing the virus to you by being in proximity to. Have either of you heard from any churches or other congregations deciding to meet for regular services or change what they're currently doing? On our weekly EMA call, uh, it was noted that churches are beginning to make those decisions. Uh, there were no details about specific churches, but Yes, they're looking at alterations of their uh, services. In Illinois, uh, tier one mitigations uh, limit gatherings to 25 people or fewer as long as the room is big enough to handle that. So that's not 25 people in your house. That's 25 people in a very, very large room. And there's a complicated formula that tells you how many square feet you have to have per person. Um, but, you know, if you just want to think of it as you have to have a room big enough where there is six feet of space between you and every other person, every other of those 24 people in the room, that goes to show you that that's a very large room. Um, so uh, churches over here um, have not been um, gathering for, for some time um, per the Restore Illinois guidelines. Thank you both to responding to those questions we received. I don't see any additional at this point, so we'll go ahead and conclude the briefing for today. Um, as always, the recording of this is going to be posted on the Scott County Health Department's website, as well as our Facebook pages. Um, we are grateful for all of your help in sharing this information. We encourage you to please continue sharing our, our broad messages about the critical time that we're in between our healthcare systems as well as public health and um, hope you can continue sharing that in the future. Um, please know we'll send you any new information as it comes, but otherwise, thank you. Have a good afternoon and have a nice weekend.